Hey guys, Molson here. So the following game was played in 1993 between Josh Waitzkin and Aviv Friedman in New York. And the reason why I'm showing you this game is because it's very relevant to the next video. And it was one of the first lines I learned against the exchange French, which particularly scored very, very well. And I also used a similar idea in many other similar IQP type of middle games. So the position arose is after e6, d4, d5, and then we can exchange French. Of course, um, it's not the best variation you should consider, but back then I had very specific ideas based on this game. c4, knight f6, knight c3, bishop e7, bishop d3, the knight goes to e2. Often the knight goes to f3 in IQP positions, but this is a different idea. Captures, captures, knight d7, castles, knight b6, bishop b3, and c6. So what black do, is doing here is completely normal, and it's the correct way of playing this position. You should be trying to fight for the square in front of the isolated queen's pawn. Here white played the move rook to e1, sort of x-raying the bishop on e7 for potential tactics later on. And white's idea is to wait for black to develop the light squared bishop so here, no matter where black develops the light squared bishop, we will start to um, attack and take advantage of, of black's development. Bishop f5 is played, and white's idea is to play knight g3, bishop g6, and here white's idea is to harass the bishop on g6 and play against it with the move pawn to f4. The idea is to shut it off the game with the move pawn to f5 next. And here would be also trapping the bishop, so black should play the move pawn to h6. Bishop d6 was also another possibility. And white's idea is to go f5, bishop h7, bishop e3. So we want to go queen f3 next, but we just want to make sure the d4 pawn is well guarded. Bishop f2, queen d7, and queen to f3. And now we can see that with the knight on g3 and the queen on f3, supporting the pawn on f5 as long as we keep our structure intact this bishop on h7 is completely out of the game and we have the freedom of putting pressure on d5 square and playing around it bishop d6 was played bishop c2 further solidifying the f5 square knight goes to e7 and here white plays a very very interesting idea which i've sort of mentioned in the past but we've never seen this idea in action and that is the idea of playing your rook to e5 and putting it on pre but in exchange for a kingside poor majority and here if black decides to capture the rook then the kingside poor majority is just simply too strong and white will be able to force through an attack as we'll see in the game so black played rook f to e8 and here white simply just doubles rooks on the e5 and says black can capture my rook on e5 but it doesn't matter because the the pawns I'll get in return will be too strong and I'll forcefully get a very dangerous attack going. Black takes it. I think the best move for black might be just to wait around and play moves like king h8 but it's very very uncomfortable because it's very easy for white to improve his position. I can play moves like a3, bishop b3, and so on, but it's not so clear how black improves his position without eventually capturing the rook. But in the game we have captures, white captures back, knight to d5 is played, and then white um, avoids the exchanges with the move, knight to e4. So white's idea here is to forcefully get through some e6 or f6 ideas as well as knight h5 and queen g4 ideas coming as well. Knight b4 was played and here white missed a very strong opportunity to win the game right away with the move knight to h5 so instead of moving the bishop could have played the move knight to h5 threatening knight to f6 and there's no way for black to capture the pawn on f5 because knight f6 is always a threat. We're also threatening knight takes g7 sometimes as well as queen g4. So there's just too many threats here for black to handle and white is just completely winning. 
For example, knight e to d5 is well met by the move queen to g3. So attacking g7, threatening knight to f6. And if bishop g6, then we have e6. And white is just crashing through. Instead, white played the move bishop to b1, which is also completely fine. Knight to d5 was played, and then queen to g4, threatening the move knight to h5 next. Rook takes e5, knight to h5. And bishop to d4 might have been a slightly more accurate continuation here. But knight to h5, bishop to g6 is a very strong move, and the only move to defend. And white tries the move knight takes g7 here. The game continued, king takes, bishop to d4. Objectively, maybe black is okay and he can try to hang on, but uh, it's, it's very, very difficult. Rook to e8, queen to g3, we're attacking the pin piece. Queen takes f5 and then white plays the move knight to d6. And now white is completely winning. We have this pin on the rook, we have a fork on the rook as well as the queen and opening of the bishop on b1 as well. So black plays the move king to f8. Bishop takes e5 was played. The queen's under attack as well as the rook, so the queen moves. But now we can start trading off pieces. We have knight takes rook, queen takes g3, bishop takes, bishop takes b1 and Instead of taking the bishop right away, which would be winning as well, we can throw in bishop d6 check and here black resigns because once the king moves, we will capture the bishop for free. So that's it for this example. I just wanted to show this idea of doubling along the e-file by putting your rook on pre and also how you can use your pawns to create a very dangerous kingside um, pawn majority, which can lead to a dangerous kingside attack. So thanks for watching this video and I will catch you on the next one.